felt like we needed some bagpipes in that song. <laughs> Did anybody else think that we needed that? Some bagpipes or something. Love is in you. <laughs> that would have been cool. We could have got, uh, where's, where's he at? Brother Jones, where's he at? Oh, we could have got you up here in a kilt and playing the bagpipe. And you'd have looked cool. You'd look cool, man. <laughs> oh, mercy. Amen. So good again to see you today out to the house of the Lord. My daughter said, we're going to start introducing some different kind of songs on during the offering and see how people react to them. So how would you all like that song? Is that all right? You all like that one? It's different. It's different, but uh, I like it. Revival's in the air. Catch it if you can. I was singing, I already caught it because I could. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Never heard it before, so I wasn't sure when I was supposed to come up. Jeremy said, go ahead, go on up. And then they start singing it again. I was like, well, you sorry, dog. Put me up front of everybody. Don't even know the song. I'm sitting here going. That's when you go. You do all that stuff then. And you look like you're getting touched from the Lord or something. But anyway. Amen. Uh, good to see you today. Uh, uh, we, uh, we are planning on having a good time here. Uh, already had a, a good touch of the Lord in this place. I just want to say uh, how good it is to see my uh, handsome grandson. I had to go over and kiss him uh, just a little while ago because uh, he's probably the best looking baby boy in, uh, in all of Wichita Falls, I think. Um, so if you have a grandson that's semi good looking, um, I mean, I'm not trying to put you down or anything, but, you know, I do have good grandkids that are amazing. And uh, if I'd have known how much fun they were, we'd have bypassed the kids and just had the grandkids. Amen. Hallelujah. Whoo, these parents in here are so energetic. Hallelujah. Uh, it is so good to see Stephen and Melanie here. Uh, I, I just told him this morning, I, put, I did one of those whoo, sha ba 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 kind of things and said, I believe the Lord wants you to move. And he says, yeah, but it ain't going to be here. <laughs> and I was like, oh, come on now. Um, I believe you need to sell that property you bought. Uh, you don't need a grass skirt. Uh, and you need to just go ahead and come on home. The Lord wills it. Um, at least I'll speak it enough to where maybe you'll catch it. Uh, how many can believe uh, Matthew is driving a car? Um, he, uh, the boy's got a beard and everything. I went back there and I went, dear God in heaven, the boy's got facial hair. He's got a driver's license. When I got here, he was just a little bitty boy in uh, in the, the children's church. And I looked at him now and I was like, my goodness gracious, they're growing up. And, uh, you know, they say when you hit a certain age that you start reversing in age. So uh, I'm not getting older. I'm just getting younger. Hallelujah. But anyway, so. So good to, uh, to see y'all here today. Amen. Uh, I can't believe you got two more kids. Uh, you haven't grown any more hair, but that's good. I mean, that's just the way it is. Every time him and his brother walk in, I see Gerald Jones. Every single time. Oh, my gosh, they look like their dad. So, so good to see you guys. Um, Monica, did your mama leave? Yeah, I had a feeling it would be tough for her today. I, um, we had uh, her daddy's funeral. Sister Tammy, uh, those of you, uh, most of you know her, is Melissa Zamora's sister. Uh, her husband, Pete, died, which would be Monica's father. Um, we had his funeral yesterday. I was so surprised when she walked in here, and I just couldn't believe that she would uh, be able to make it today, and, and uh, it was tough, so she went home. But uh, keep them in prayer. Uh, married a long time, and uh, he went home to be with Jesus this last week, and uh, we are, uh, we're jealous uh, that he is where we all want to be. Amen. So uh, God bless you guys. Amen. It's so good to see everybody today. Let me, uh, let me jump right on in the word uh, this morning. Father God, I love you and thank you for what you do. I pray, God, that you would bless us in this place. Don't let me say or do anything that would grieve your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, uh, before I get into this, I've had people over the last few weeks tell me, you look uh, like you're upset, something's wrong, uh, you're not moving around like you were, you, we're used to seeing you do, do this and that. Um, I start therapy tomorrow morning on my leg. Uh, it's I don't know what I've done, but it hurts, and it, it w I've tried everything. It won't quit. Uh, it's been almost four months, and uh, it's it's gotten to the point now where I can barely walk on it. Uh, so I try to stand in one spot, and that's what I've been doing for the last few months is trying to stand in one spot, uh, which is really kind of weird that you'd go out and buy a farm in the middle of all that, but we did. And uh, uh, anyway, so I'm trying to uh, limp my way along. Don't know what's wrong, but... Uh, going to find out tomorrow, and then they want me to start therapy, and I just told them that therapy will be just fine, just don't touch it. So, uh, amen. 
Uh, so I can't wear boots, and I want to preach in tennis shoes. And when I get done on Sunday, I am usually at home. Uh, my daughter came over a couple Sundays ago after church and had dinner with us, and she looked at me, and she went, what in the world is wrong with you? Uh, and it's just uh, old age and being around old people, it rubs off every now and then. So, so if I've had dinner with you lately, <clears throat> <there's no laughs> amen. So we're in a series right now called Hard Reset. Um, the thought process behind this series is the way that God can take a life filled with so much pain, so much destruction, um, whether it was self-inflicted or just things that have taken place in life, and just completely turn lives around and give it a new start, a new beginning, or give us a hard reset. And my, 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 did God show up last week in this place. Come on, were you here last Sunday? My Lord, Holy Spirit showed up in this place and gave several people a reset in their lives, and I truly believe what the church is seeing right now is the beginning. This is just the beginning. Now, some will disagree with what I'm going to say. Just give me a minute to get, uh, dig into this, um, that this is the beginning, as the book of Matthew says, of sorrows, but the end is not yet. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, it's either true or the Bible is false, and we all just need to go home. Uh, the new beginning. The, the hard reset that I believe is coming to the church is going to happen after people have been so frustrated and abused by the world that we will begin to see that we have a need for Jesus in, the, in, in the, our lives again. Um, you hear me, life is still too good for the church. I, I'm just going to go ahead and say that again. Uh, please just hear me for a few minutes this morning. Uh, we're not where a reset can happen yet in the church world. Life's still too good. It's still too good. People still come up with every flimsy excuse for everything, and life is still too good. Uh, this is going to be tough, a little bit tough this morning. I uh, haven't said that in a while, but just hang on with me for a few minutes, okay? So let's just be real honest. What we've been doing as a whole for bringing the lost to Christ in the American church, let's just be honest, it's not been working, has it? Let's Come on, be honest bringing the lost to Christ, what we've been doing for the last several years in the church, in the church world, it hasn't been working. Can anybody say amen, oh me, or ouch? When I, when I say we, I'm talking about the churches in America. My heart can't help but flood with tears as I watch crusades uh, all over the world, and thousands of people are weeping their way through to Calvary. I just cannot help it, but I sit and bawl my eyes out as I watch them pray, and then I watch the passion that comes to them as they pray, and they don't just regurgitate something that was said, but I mean they are in the dirt, pounding on the ground, asking Jesus to touch their lives. They walk for miles to get to a service. Come on. They walk for miles. Is anybody in here today? They walk for miles to get to a church service. Sometimes they have bicycles. Very few would have cars. They would be considered extremely wealthy. But they walk for miles in the extreme heat to get to service or in the extreme cold or floods while we in America argue about, well, you really don't have to go to church to be saved. Come on, if you're going to shake your head at me, make sure you talk about it right at, at work on Monday because your coworkers call and tell what you say. Huh? Come on. They stand for hours while they're at service, and they worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we complain if service goes past 1130 or 12, especially when the Cowboys are playing. Mm -hmm. This will get some criticism for what I'm going to say next, but we've become experts at the 45-minute to one-hour service. We've become experts at it. 15 minutes of this, 15 minutes of that, 15 minutes of message, 15 minutes of preliminaries, and get them out the door. Just make sure you get the offering first. Come on. Come on. We become expert at the, uh, experts at the hour-long get them in, get them up, get them out Sunday morning roundup. I mean, we don't want to inconvenience anybody, do we? I mean, he only gave his son to take an unmitigated beating for us, to die on a cross for us, and we can't get out of it. I mean, whew, God's calling me to a great ministry. He can't even show up to church. 
COVID. Don't tell me COVID. You go everywhere else. Come on, don't use that excuse. Don't use it. Come on. Amen. People have gotten comfortable living half in, half out. Yeah. Completely bound by fear. I listen to people talk about faith, but don't live any of it. They just talk about it. The current temperature of lukewarmness is nauseating. Mm -hmm. I said it, didn't I? Go ahead and double dog dare me to say it again. The current temperature of lukewarmness is nauseating. And he said in the last days this would be the condition of the church and that he would spew us out. Yeah. I can hardly believe folks that are blinded by their own likes that they don't understand the word. There are so many that think the gospel revolves around them and what they want. And can I just say this? God isn't concerned about our comfort as much as he is concerned about our souls. Yeah. Uh, th this is why I, I have been saying for years, pain is a great motivator for change. It's a great motivator. When mama said, don't put your hand on the burner, and I put it on the burner, and then I started screaming, and Mama's kissing the boo-boo and putting salve on it and wrapping it up, and Daddy says, Dummy, I bet you don't do it again. Pain is a great motivator for change. Guess what? I hadn't never put my hand on a hot burner since I was about five years old. Amen. It hurt. I didn't want to do it again. And listen, what I'm saying to you is this, that... Uh, um, a lot of what we have went through in the world, in the church world over the last few years has been small tremors of what I believe is to come. It's been small doses of tough times to try to get us to change. And I believe according to the book of Matthew, chapter 24, chapter 25, the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Things are going to get worse. Uh, uh, it, it, it is crazy um, the hatred people have towards other folks. I preached on this just a couple weeks ago about racism. It's crazy to me the hatred that exists in the families today talk about the love of God and can't even go to a family reunion because you hate somebody there. Hello? Come on. Are you here? Amen. A hatred towards people. Won't go to church for every flimsy excuse you can find. Can't rule their own house well. Don't trust God enough to tithe and wonder why your ministry don't bear fruit or why it's never took off. This is the reason the old-timers were called the army of God. They knew they were going to take blows in serving God, but they kept on the firing line, which is found on the page 212 in the red back hymnal. You must fight and be brave against all evil. Never run or even lag behind. If you would win for God in the right, just keep on the firing line. We can't keep on the firing line if somebody doesn't like our status. Mm -hmm. Hello? Comfortable. Seeker sensitive. This stuff may get people to the door, but it will not hang on to them. Mm -hmm. We've got to train and prepare warriors. It is quiet in here. I knew it would be. Um, I, I, I'm just being honest with you. This week has been so busy. I, I have never, I, you know, I thought I've had bad weeks before, but I don't know that I've ever had a week as bad as this last week. I was so busy doing everything other than what I was supposed to do. If I shared with you some of the things that happened, which my wife would kill me, I, I, I've never, listen, I pray for people. I go visit people, and this week I was going, God, would you just lay me on somebody's heart and have them pray for my family because there is so much going on that nobody knows about, and we can't talk to anybody. I'm in here last night tying up loose ends, and my wife comes home or goes home, and she calls me and said, do you want the bad news or the bad news? And I went, oh, no. What else could go wrong? Don't ever ask that. I said, are you kidding me? And she said, it's 88 degrees in the house. The air conditioning went out. I said, thank God for home warranty. 
Hallelujah. Amen. And so I made a phone call real quick and thought that I would get an appointment for today, but they sent somebody last night, and by midnight, the house got down below 75. Ooh, do you feel the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Amen. I did. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, so busy this last week with everything except what I felt like I was supposed to be doing. And I, I got to tell you, I saw my humanity break out. Some of you won't like me for this because you've been perfect since the day you were born and came out of your mother's womb. And when they wiped the afterbirth off you, they had to set your halo right and you glowed in the dark. You were so perfect. I understand. But I got to tell you, this week I saw my humanity in my flesh that I haven't seen in a long time. And I did not like what I saw. Is it all right for me to say that? And when I finally got alone with God and said, Holy Spirit, I, I, I can't live like this. I don't like these feelings, and I don't like the way what's going on in my life right now. I don't like this attack. He said, what does disciple mean? And I said, well, I know what disciple means. It's the root word for the word discipline, and that's where you get the word disciple. And he said, you have been raised in a spirit of discipline you know how to discipline your life and do the things that I want you to do and you've allowed everything else to keep you so preoccupied that you have not been a good disciple this week or disciplined yourself in the last two weeks in the last two weeks I have had three different people that no longer attend this church that I was mentoring they called me this week and they said this. These were the words they said to me. I wrote it down on a sticky note, all three, and all I did was put two next to it when the next one called, and then I scratched through that and wrote three. But this is what they said. They all said we should have stayed undercover. They were all in a mentoring course we did years ago called Undercover, that we had Bible studies at 6 a.m. with different men. They said, we should have stayed undercover. I should have stayed undercover and worked under your covering. But when we got out on our own, and I warned them, they shouldn't have done it. They said, but when we got out on our own, we stopped doing A, B, and C, and D. We stopped doing the things that we knew we were supposed to do, and things just didn't work, and now our life is falling apart. And I told them, listen, fellas, God can give you a new beginning and a hard reset. Come on. But it takes discipline. And one of them said, discipline, disciple. And I said, that's right. It takes discipline. Listen, the story I'm going to talk to you about today, um, it may take next week to get all the way through this and cover the entire story. There's so much to it. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm going to do my very best to, I hear you, Holy Ghost. I'm going to do my very best to uh, get through as much as I can without keeping you too long because we have burgers and hot dogs waiting out back. Does anybody feel the Holy Ghost on that? Hallelujah, I do. Amen. If you can't stay and eat, just make a donation. They don't care, and Kevin and I will eat it for lunch Monday and Tuesday while we're here at the church with Sister Melissa. Actually, she eats nothing but water with fruit in it and, and, and salads and stuff like that. I mean, good Lord. She said, you want some of my salad? I said, I'm a man. I eat real food. Hallelujah. I don't eat salad. Amen. Can I just say this because I've heard it two or three different times now? I just felt the Holy Spirit t uh, speak to my heart and tell me to tell somebody that's watching us online this morning. You Listen to what I'm telling you. I just felt him say, see, I just heard him again. Yes, you. You just said to yourself, was that me? I heard you. And, and, and the Holy Spirit said, yes, you. I feel like I need to tell you this. You're making a mistake. You're about to make a decision that's going to cost you dearly. Pray about it. The way you think it's going to turn out, it's not going to work. You need to pray about it. Now, let me jump into the story this morning. Somebody say Lazarus. Okay, Lazarus was sick. John 11, verse number 1. A certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Man, that's a lot of words to say somebody was sick. Uh, Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. And when Jesus heard that, listen, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard the man is sick, he said this, the sickness is not a sickness unto death, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now can I just say this to you, that I believe Jesus loves us so much that even in our worst circumstances, he will use those bad situations and bad circumstances and he will turn them around to demonstrate his love towards us. Can anybody say amen? 
So many people over the years have preached this text and, and uh, preached messages along these lines, and I've preached from it many times myself. And I, I, I want to show you an angle that maybe you've never seen before. And again, I don't know how far I'll get, but I want to show you an angle that I believe will illustrate best a hard reset or a new beginning in someone's life. Now, I don't think this story is as much about Lazarus, although it is about Lazarus like we talked last week, but there are parenthetical stories inside of stories. And this story is about Lazarus and his sisters, but I believe there's other people that are involved here. So I don't think it's as much about Lazarus or his family as much as it is about the disciples that that were watching this whole thing take place and the situations that were surrounding their lives. So I want to try to move through this real quick. In John 11, verse number 5, the Bible said, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days in the place where he was. So Jesus hears Lazarus is sick. He loves them a lot, loves the family, and he loves them so much that he doesn't go help them. He just decides to stay right there for two more days. Okay, Lazarus is sick, so I'm just going to wait to go see him. So just uh, obvious things start going through my mind like, why would he sit there? Why Why is he not going to see him? Why didn't Jesus just speak the word? He had done it for other people. Just speak the word. You don't have to come to my house and my servant can be healed. Why would he have done it for somebody else and not them? It would have been so much easier. I mean, why didn't he just leave? Another thing, why did he just leave and go right there to Bethany and help, this, uh, help Lazarus, his friend, whom the Bible said he loved? Point number two is Lazarus is not just sick, but the Bible says that Lazarus goes a step beyond that and he dies the Bible said in verse 17 that when he arrived in Bethany Lazarus had been dead four days already now I am pretty confident he knew this, this information before he got to Bethany I'm pretty sure he knew before he ever arrived in Bethany and while he was telling his disciples that the sickness isn't a sickness to death, I am pretty sure Jesus was setting them up for a hard reset because when he told them that this sickness is not a sickness unto death, he had already been dead. News had just reached him. There was no email. There was no internet. He had already passed away because the Bible said when he got there, he was already dead four days. Come on, are you here? Amen. So let me show you what I'm talking about. John 11, verse number 12. His disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, if he sleeps, uh, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, uh, but they thought he was speaking about, ta uh, about taking rest in sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, I love it. L listen how plain he is. Lazarus is dead, boys. I mean, dead, dead. oh, oh, so this sickness isn't a sickness to death. He's just sleeping. Oh, yeah, I, okay. Well, yeah, that's no big deal. And Jesus goes, He's dead. He's dead, okay? And and I am glad, listen to this, and I am glad for your sakes that I wasn't there. Woo, my gosh. That, I mean, that's just kind of plain English right there. Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. And that uh, so that you may believe, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, let's go to him. Believe what? He is telling them, what I'm fixing to do is going to blow your mind. I'm going to show you something that can happen in your life uh, uh, physically, that can happen in your life spiritually, uh, that, that, uh, that is going to blow your mind. Now, l listen, there are three different kind of people in the world today. How many of y'all know that? They're not red, yellow, black, white, brown, or any of that kind of stuff. There's three different kind of people in the world today. Are you ready? Are you taking notes? All right, are you ready for this? There are people that watch things happen. There are people that make things happen. And then there are the people that wonder what's happened. <laughs> yeah, amen. The disciples have left everything. They have left everything to follow Jesus. Now, I just give a few examples here, and I don't have time to run through that. The fishermen, uh, the fishermen, they left their boats. The doctor quit seeing his patients, and the tax collector quit collecting. Come on. What an amazing opportunity these 12 guys had. What an amazing opportunity to be mentored by the Son of God. Now, I said this last week. I've had the opportunity to mentor a lot of young men and a few ladies over the years, and it's been neat, and some of them have really took off and done some really good things in their lives and in ministry, and I'm so proud of them. Not jealous. I am so proud that they are doing so well. But when I think about this, that these guys were handpicked by Jesus himself to be mentored. That is just absolutely crazy. Bob, you went to Bible college. Could you imagine going to Jesus college right there with him all day, every day? 
<laughs> that is so cool. I, I just can't even imagine what it must have been like for them. They didn't read in a textbook what happened. They didn't hear about the miracles secondhand. These guys were right there with the Son of God, and they saw everything happening. Jesus looks at his disciples, and he says this to them. He said, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I wasn't there, and that you may believe. Uh, now listen to this. I'm, let me focus on one little phrase here. I'm glad I wasn't there for him. I am glad I wasn't there for him. Why? Because there is more of me that you need to know. There is more about me that you need to know. There's more things about me than just your buddy. I'm glad you see me as your buddy. But listen, boys, I am more than a friend. I am the Messiah. I am the great I am. I am my Father's Son, and I can do all things things. Amen. I can show you some things in your life, but we're getting to the point where you are so familiar with me now that you don't understand the things that I can do in your life. That would preach right there a whole different direction. Now, I want you to notice something after this verse. He tells them this. He says, uh, I'm glad I wasn't there for him so that you, now listen to what he said. Remember we, we talked about this, uh, that most people make the story about Lazarus and his sisters, and that's great. I'm glad. I'm just wondering... That that's a wonderful story, but I believe there's a story inside of this. He said, I'm glad I wasn't there for Lazarus right now so that you can believe. He was talking directly to the disciples, and he was telling them, there are some things that you guys have seen, but you still haven't seen anything. Come on. He said, there's more that you need to see. Amen. Now, I want you to notice something, okay? There isn't another mention of the disciples again in this story until verse 38. There is not one mention of them when they arrive into town. No more traveling. No more banter back and forth. Everything is quiet when it, where it concerns the disciples. There is not a mention of them as they travel to Bethany or after they get to Bethany until they are at the graveside. There is no more mention except Jesus told them right before he got silent on them. He said, you're going to see me in a different light. I'm doing this so you will believe. Believe what? They left everything to go with him. There must must have been something more that he wanted them to see than what they had originally saw. Right? Come on, are you with me? All right. So th there is absolutely nothing going on. They're not asking questions according to the word. We're not getting any of this stuff. They are not mentioned. They don't even seem to play any important uh, part of the story uh, uh, from this time until verse 38 at the graveside. Now, why is that important? Why is that important? Because sometimes in order to roll away the stone at somebody in somebody's life, you've got to learn to be submitted to an authority. Whoo, come on now. Let me say that again. Why is it important that nothing else was said? Why, why is all this important? Be, because if you want to roll away a stone at somebody's grave, come on, or you want to lift the lid uh, at, at, a, uh, at, at a funeral, listen, you have to be submitted to somebody who is over you, and you have to be okay with being corrected. <laughs> Let me just tell this real quick. Uh, my wife has... Uh, horrible asthma. She has a nebulizer at home. She has to take this uh, medicine three or four times a day. She has to put the mask on. Uh, she looks like Darth Vader with it on, and it's really loud. Can't hear the TV or anything. And uh, she has to carry these little puffers because of her asthma. If she walks into a place where somebody's been smoking, uh, I'm not picking on smokers, okay, but if you, she walks into a place where there's been heavy smoking, she has to leave immediately, and she has to go outside and start puffing her thing. Well, uh, the little girl we adopted, Ari, uh, she was in my truck yesterday, and we were riding somewhere, and uh, my wife left one of the puffers in the door handle of the truck. And she said, Ooh, Papa, Mama left her smoker that she smokes in the truck. And I went, Ari, that's not a smoker, because I know what that little five-year-old will do. She'll go around telling everybody, I got Mommy's smoker. Yeah, Mommy's smoker's in the truck. And I was going, oh, dear God. And then we got home, and she said, Mama, Daddy told me I couldn't touch your smoker that's in his truck. And she goes, Ari, that's an inhaler. It's not a smoker. Because she started thinking, oh, 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 I know what she's going to do. Come on, are you here? How many of y'all got kids like that that'll just say crazy, crazy stuff like that? Come on, are you here? Amen. Uh, you got you got to watch them, right? Uh, li listen, um, you, you have to be all right with being corrected. And I kept telling her all week, Ari, <laughs> uh, that's not a smoker, that's a puffer. Uh, can I just say this, that there are some times that you have to be okay with being corrected. 
even as adults, there are some times that we have to be okay with being corrected. Paul said and gave us instruction that we as shepherds are supposed to correct and rebuke and exhort, he said, with all long suffering. So it's not being sharp or being hard or trying to be contentious, but there are some times you have to look at people and you have to look at different situations and say, it's not the way you think it is. There's other sides to the story, and you need to just allow me to be the shepherd and understand where that goes. How many of you would employ somebody who questioned everything that was ever done? Listen, you get paid to do a job. Do the job. Hello? Hello. If you see something illegal or could potentially hurt somebody, then speak up. But otherwise, don't question every little thing I do. If I say go over there and pick that up, don't ask me if you need to squat down with your knees and pick it up. Good Lord, just pick the thing up and let's go. Hello? I can't stand foolishness. Anybody else? Lloyd, you're saying a lot of amens right there. You must, yeah, hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. Uh, so so watch this now, okay? Watch this now. We're going to back up in the chapter now to verse number 5, okay? We're talking about being submitted to an authority. Let me just go ahead and stop here a minute. i got to do this, okay? Uh, so uh, when I tell Ari, I said, you don't, it's not a smoker, it's a puffer, okay? I tell her, it's not a smoker, <laughs> it's a puffer. Um, she... Uh, she was saying, oh, well, here's what I'm worried about. I'm worried she's going to run around and tell everybody we have a, a smoker. Well, we do. It smokes brisket. Smoking one right. <laughs> but uh, 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 can I tell you what one of the most dirty words in the church world today is? Submitted. Submitted. It's right up there with tithing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things that nobody wants to hear. I'm submitted to God. Boy, could I get into that. Amen. All right, so let's back up to verse number five real quick, okay? I want to show you verse number five, and then we'll work our way back down through here, and I promise I won't be any more than 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes, okay? Uh, John 11, verse number five. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that she was sick, or that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was, and then after he said this, uh, then after he said this to his disciples, his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Now watch. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews have sought to stone you, and uh, you, are, you're going to go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Here's what Jesus was saying to the disciples, okay? He was saying... Uh, 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 to the disciples who were a little bit confused and concerned of why Jesus would want to go and wake up, as he said, or heal or raise him up in the area, uh, raise up Lazarus from the dead in an area where they wanted him dead previously. They're saying, why are we going there? They wanted to kill you in that same spot, okay? Let me, let me read it again. He said to the disciples, uh, or the disciples said unto him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going to go there again? So the disciples are questioning it, and, and Jesus is telling, uh, telling them this. He said, he said um, if you're waiting for everything to be perfect in your life, you've got a long wait. This is what he's saying. He's saying, if you're waiting for everything to be perfect in life, to step up and step out, uh, then you can't be my disciples. You're never going to play an important role in ministry or in my life to help me if you, can't, if you have to sit and wait for everything to be perfect. I'm the Son of God. I know what they want to do to me. I know they're trying to take my life. I know things aren't very good in Judea right now. But listen, I'm not in it for the income. I'm in it for the outcome. Come on, are you here? I do this because it's the will of the Father, not because, hear me now, I'm doing this, boys, not because it's easy I'm not doing this because it's comfortable. I'm doing it because it's the will of my Father. Listen, Legacy Church, hear me this morning. Legacy Church of God, listen, family. Resets will cost you something. Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his own son in Genesis 22. Naaman was commanded to wash uh, his leprosy in a body of muddy water in 2 Kings 5. Jesus was uh, uh, just told two sisters that their brother's illness wouldn't result in death, and he was already dead. Come on, amen. But Abraham eventually sees God's plan in Genesis 22. Naaman gets healed in 2 Kings 5, and Lazarus will soon be resurrected because the resurrection and the life was standing right there with him. Can I say this to you? Resets are costly, and at times resets don't make any good sense. They will cause you to look as though you are out of touch with the world and you have lost your mind, but hear me, God knows what he is doing. Can somebody say amen? 
I debated on using this this morning, so please don't be upset with me. I was, uh, I, I was wanting to use this point, and, and I was going to talk about a graveside service, and we had a funeral yesterday, so I'm trying to be sensitive to everything that, was, that, that went on yesterday, but let me talk about this for just a second, a graveside service. Somebody say graveside. Let me read you some scripture here. Verse 32. Uh, John eleven thirty two. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell uh, fell down at his feet, saying, "Lord, if I if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died." Man, that just takes some nerve, don't it? If you'd have been here, he'd have been all right. But you stayed two more days. You loved us so much. If God loves me, why did this happen to me? Man, I could have said that a hundred times this week. Amen. She fell down at his feet, and she started accusing him. Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Graveside, committal services, okay? Committal services are usually the most difficult things to be at when you do a funeral. They are usually the worst part. Let me tell you why. It is, so to speak, the last view of the loved one. It is the last time you'll even see that casket. It, it's gone. Uh, it is the final goodbye. When you say goodbye to somebody and they take them to the graveside, that is the final goodbye. Now listen, Jesus gets there, the funeral's over. He's been in a tomb for four days. They are at a graveside of Lazarus, and they are mourning the loss. And Jesus shows up at Lazarus' house, and what he sees crushes his heart. Mary falls at his feet, and she is crying, and the people are crying. And the word says Jesus began to groan in the spirit, and he was troubled. That literally means he was troubled in his spirit, not an angry trouble. It just means his spirit was troubled, but, uh, uh, not because of anything they were doing, but because people that he loved had to suffer the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is death. Death should have never been on the table, but because of sin in the world, people he loved were being tore up in their heart, and Jesus was very concerned. So he asked them, where have you laid him? Can I just say this real quick? I love, I love the demonstration of a servant's heart, that Jesus begins to weep. The Bible said he felt their pain, and he was weeping as well. So he asked, where have you laid him? Now, i got to say this to you. I'm pretty sure Jesus knew where he was at already. I'm pretty sure. I don't think he had to ask them, uh, wh where did y'all bury him at? What cemetery did you go over Southwest Parkway? Was it City View? Did you go to Iowa Park, Iowa Park? Did you go over to Petroleum? Where'd you go? Uh, wh wh where's he at? I'm sure he already knew. So when I read this, where have you laid him? And the Son of God is asking this question. Brother David Helms, I got to tell you something. What that tells me is he's up to something right here. He's up to something. Now, maybe you've never seen this before, but let me just preach right here for just a second, okay? I'm pretty sure he knew where Lazarus was buried, but uh, not only was he concerned for Mary and Martha and their friends, but remember why the disciples didn't want him to go there to begin with? Do you remember why? These were the people that wanted Jesus dead, and now they're here, and they are mourning with... Uh, it's possible some of those people that wanted him dead that were in the crowd screaming, uh, we need to kill this guy, he needs to be killed. Uh, 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 they could possibly be there with the mourners because, see, they hired professional mourners to go out and grieve for 30 days in Jewish history uh, for people who had died. So I'm thinking when Jesus says, where have you laid him, there is a crowd of people around at the house. Mary and Martha are there. Uh, Jesus is there. And Jesus looks at them. His heart is breaking. He weeps. They said, look how much he loved him. Look how much he loves them. And a Jesus says, where have you laid him? The Bible didn't say he whispered it. He looked at them and said, where have you laid him? I have to think that there's an ulterior motive going on here. So then I get to thinking to myself, what would the ulterior motive be? Well, here's what I think. They did not want him to go there to begin with because they wanted him dead the last time he was there. The, the scripture I read to you earlier clearly says, the peop these people wanted you stoned earlier. They ran you out of town and we escaped. And now here they are. Where you wanting to go right back there and, and preach this guy's funeral? or do something. What in the world are you wanting to do? And Jesus gets right in the middle of them and all says, where'd you lay him? So I'm thinking he's got an ulterior motive. And here's what I think that ulterior motive is. I think he already knew where he was, but I think he wanted the people who wanted him dead, that didn't like him, that had uh, aught in their heart against him. I think he was trying to build some excitement and build something and build some anticipation. I think he looked at them and said, where's we laid him? So they would all hear and say, oh, what is going on? What is going on? Why does he want to know that? Why? Come on, has anybody ever thought about this before? I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, there was something else going in here. Uh, so, uh, so listen, y'all want me dead. You tried to kill me. But come watch this. 
Come watch what's fixing to happen. I'm fixing to show, show y'all something that will change your life forever. Life changing. Life changing. Listen. Listen. Listen to Legacy Church of God. Hear me. When the dead gets up, the funeral's over. Hello. When they climb out, of the, the funeral's over. Amen. Now, now, let me say something. Some of y'all may not care for this ministry. It's not my favorite, but I was there and seen it with my own eyes. And if my wife was here, she would tell you the same the same story. Um, so let, let me tell you the story. I was in a revival service at a church called uh, World Harvest Church uh, no, back in the, the mid-90s in Ohio. I had just started pastoring. I wasn't any good at it. Didn't know what I was doing. Green as grass and dumb as a monkey. I mean, I didn't know nothing. I ran off more people than ever came to the church, and I didn't know nothing. And I went to this camp meeting. I went to camp meetings all the time, but it was just mainly social agendas and uh, church swapping and all that. So I went someplace where I didn't know anybody and said, God, I want to see you move. I want to do something great in my life, and I want to see you move. Please show me something. Amber was here. She's just a little girl back then. So we went to Rod Parsley's camp meeting in Columbus, Ohio. We lived in Michigan, and it was just a few hours there. So we went ahead and drove there to their service. I had just started passing. I loved God, but I hadn't been challenged a whole lot and hadn't really been trained yet. I had never done MIP, hadn't took my license, and he had put me in there because nobody wanted that church. Well, he's an hour away. Just let him go up there and close it up. I mean, nobody else wants it. Uh, there's no money and no people. So while I'm at this service, uh, the Holy Ghost just caught me completely by surprise. I know where I'm at, know where I'm going, so hold on. I'm going to tie this all together, and then we'll be done in just a minute, okay? In the middle of this service, Rod Parsley is getting up to preach that night. And he says, I want to call up here two of our World Harvest Bible College students. I don't know what it's called now, but it was World Harvest Bible College back then. And he calls these two young men up, and they were Latino men. He called them on the stage, and he says, I want them to share their testimony, and I'm going to show you something that is going to blow the, the socks right off you. You are not going to believe what's what, what I'm going to show you. And these guys get up there, and they start talking about being in Mexico at a funeral service uh, on a mission trip. They didn't know the deceased. They just wanted to go to a funeral and see what a Mexican funeral was like. So they went into the Mexican funeral, these two World Harvest Bible College students, and they were just there to take notes and observe. And the one looked at the other and said, hey, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. And he said, man, come on now, don't cut up in here. He said, we're foreigners here in this country. We're here on a mission trip. We're supposed to be helping people. Don't do nothing stupid. He goes, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. He said, if the Spirit don't bear witness in you, we won't do nothing. But I feel the Holy Ghost. A few minutes later, the other one turns to him and says, man, I, these are these guys telling the story on stage. And they talk with such a heavy accent, you can barely hear what they're saying and understand what they're trying to tell you. It was easy, really crazy, man. And I'm not making fun. They were, but the accent was so heavy you could barely understand them. So Parsley would go in the middle of them, and, and he would slow them down and say, Slow down, boys. Slow down a minute. <laughs> what did you say happened? So they walk up to the casket in the middle of the service. They were in funerals there were a whole lot different the way they were explaining it. And they walked up to this casket, and they looked at the lady laying in there, and the preacher was preaching. The, the priest was doing it, and he was doing the beads and the water and all that stuff. And he said, um, the Holy Ghost said, Grab her by her collar and pull her out of the casket. And he went, uh-uh. Uh-uh. He said, we're going to get strung up right here and shot and killed is what's going to happen. And he said, the Holy Ghost was so strong, he said, I could not stop. And he said, the priest stopped and looked at him and went like this like this and he said before we knew it we pulled that dead lady out of the casket he said put her on a wall and said in the name of Jesus Christ live and she started coughing she started coughing and then she started crying and he said because we spoke the native tongue he said she started speaking in an unknown tongue I'm sitting here listening to this with 20,000 other people in this church going what Whatever. This is so much. You're going to take up an offering, aren't you? That's what you're going to. I've been around this long enough to know how you hype us up. By the way, could I get the ushers to come? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so I've been around it long enough to know you got to hype them up before you take up the offering because when you bring in John Hagee and Benny Hinn back in the day and Juanita Bynum and all them, you, you got to have some money because they don't come preach for a motel room. They want $10,000 each. So you got to have some money. So uh, he, he's telling the story, and I'm going, whatever. And I'm skeptical. And. Uh, Brother Parsley gets up there, and some people are crying, and some are going, they're all sitting there next to me going, whatever, you're just full of mud. And, and he said, now, I see most of you feel about like I did, and you don't believe what's going on. He said, so we went and found the lady and brought her here. 
So she comes up on stage, and now my jaw's beginning to go, no, could this really have happened? And they do a close-up, and she has her death certificate with her. What I want to know is after you die and you come back to life, do you get another birth certificate? She has her death certificate. And then the doctor that signed the death certificate was there. And he said, let me show you. So they had pictures, and they didn't do it in front of us, but they had pictures. And, and she pulled her sleeves up like this, and she said, I can only show you the pictures on my arms because there's another in the groin, and then there was another in the bottom of the leg, and they didn't want to be in, inappropriate in church. And they, they said, uh, ma'am, what is this? And she was speaking, and they were using the interpreters, and here's what she said. This is where they embalm me. They cut your major arteries, and they drain the blood. They sew you back up, and then they embalm you so your body is good for a couple days for a funeral. And he, the doctor said, and they said, so is this your patient? He goes, she was dead. This is what she died of. This is the death certificate. And, th and we had uh, sent her over to the morgue. She was, her body, her life-giving blood was drained out of her, and she was embalmed. And those boys walked in that funeral home, stuck her to a wall, and commanded breath to come back in her. And she stood up, began to cough and sneeze, and started speaking in Tongues. Listen, come on, somebody here. L listen, I, I think what Jesus' motives here were were this. You get these folks uh, where the dead gets up and starts walking and, and get them to see what my daddy can do. And, and I, I think maybe they'll change from wanting to kill me to doing something different in their life. Listen, when I began to see some things like that and I saw that take place, it made me a God chaser from that day forward. I have never got tired of it. When I saw that, I said, God, if you can do that through them, put me in the place and make me go to the place, God, where I can do the same thing one day. It turned me into a God chaser. Listen, folks, we need to begin to operate in the hour that we are living in the supernatural. If I can take it a step further, if we don't get a real baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and not this stuff that we have learned over the years, how to babble a phrase here and there, but if we don't get the real true blue righteousness and purity of the Holy Ghost, it's going to be very difficult for us to stand in the days that are coming. We need a new beginning, and we need a hard reset. All right, I'm almost done, almost done. I can't believe I've got this far, but let me just stop. I'll stop here in five minutes. Will you give me five more minutes? Raise your hand if you give me five minutes. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. <laughs> Y'all are, you're so kind. You're so kind. All right, watch this. Verse 38, John 11, 38. Jesus began groaning in his spirit, came to the tomb. It was a cave where a stone laid in front of him. Jesus said, take you away the stone. All right, so I looked through every commentary I could find. Jesus didn't talk to those disciples again until verse number 38, and then he looked at them and said, you didn't want me to come here because you thought they were going to try to kill me. You didn't want me to come here because they, you thought they were going to try to kill me. So now here we are, and I'm going to show you boys something. This wasn't for Lazarus. This wasn't for his sisters. He said, I did this. What did he say? So you would believe so you would believe because even greater things you will do in my name but you have to believe are you here come on are you here come on are, are, is anybody here today come on all right so he looks at them and he says to the disciples take you away the stone i've got every commentary i could find he was talking to the disciples to take you away the stone martha the sister of him who was dead said to him lord uh he, there's a stench he's been dead four days can i just go ahead and say this real quick death has a stench to it there was a little boy that was locked in the trunk of a car down here. You've seen it all over the news right down here off of Maureen Street. And the neighbors were complaining about the smell that was coming out of a car. They called the police. Police pried the car open. And sure enough, it was a dead body in there, a little boy. Mother and her boyfriend took off to Las Vegas to see if they could win some money. They killed the little boy and put him in the trunk of a car. Okay? It had a smell to it. Can I just say this? Dead churches smell. Come on, dead worship smells, dead Christians smell. People who talk about yesterday and have no inclination of what God can do today or tomorrow smell. Something is wrong with a church that will sit and live in yesteryear and not understand that he is the same yesterday, today, and for tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day. We don't have to live in memories, but we can live in the, uh, in the knowledge of knowing that Jesus will do what he said he will do. Jesus said unto her, did I not say to you uh, that... Uh, 
uh, if you would believe that you would see the glory of God, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. This is called dead man walking, okay? He lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I know that you always hear me, but because of those who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe. Who was standing by? The disciples, listen, and the people who were trying to kill him. Did you get it? Who was standing there? I said this so they would believe. He told the disciples, I didn't go there so you would believe. Where have you laid him? Why did he say that to them? He already knew where he was. He's God. For Pete's sake, he stood out on nothing and flung the world into order. I mean, he, uh, the stars, the universe, everything was flung into order. Uh, surely he knows where Lazarus is. It's like when he popped into the garden. Adam, where are you? Yeah, well, dude, we're naked, man. <laughs> God knew where Adam was. He wanted him to tell. He wasn't asking where he was physically. He was saying, where is your heart? What have you done? Where have you laid him? This was all about getting people in the presence of God. Come on, do you hear me? This was all about getting people in the presence of God. Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but because of these people who are standing by, I said this, that they might believe that you sent me. They wanted to kill me because I said I was your son. The disciples don't know me the way that they need to yet. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Can I just say this to you? Do you know why Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, instead of just come forth? Because many people believe that if he would have just said, come forth, every tomb in the area that heard his voice, every dead person would have came forth. If he didn't specifically call Lazarus, every dead person in the graveyard would have gotten up. But the Bible said, and he who, was, who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. His face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Stop right here. Shutting everything off. I'm going to get my little rubber money ready. Loose him and let him go. Hard reset. Can I just say this and be as nice as I can? I really don't give a flip about a hamburger as much as I care about what God wants to do with some people in this place today. But you better save me one regardless. Loose him and let him go. We, we don't have any. Uh, my wife is at home. She plays the piano. My daughter's at home sick. She played the piano, and Jeremy had to go to his daughter's last ball game, so he told me he wouldn't be here. And Sister Tony's out of town, so he ain't been the piano player. So you just turned me something very soft and worshipful. Worshipful. Okay. Listen. Loose him and let him go. It's not that they didn't know who he was. They didn't like the answer he gave. They didn't like that. I'm the son of God. They didn't like that. We're going to take you out. It's not that they didn't know who he was. They didn't like it. You're going to put our priest out of business. It was the church people who wanted to kill him. If you are the son of God and you serve as prophet, priest, and king, well, then there's going to be no need of us. And when that veil was rent from top to bottom and it revealed the Holy of Holies, there was no need for us to go in and talk to him anymore because now we can go to God ourselves. What happened when Jesus died was that the, the spirit that was in the ark got out of the, out of the veil and we got behind it. We all could be one now. Okay, now watch. The disciples were with him. They knew who he was. Listen to this, okay? This is good preaching. You may could use this one. This is good stuff. The disciples were with him, being mentored by him, and he says, you still don't know me. How does that relate to us? We sit in church, but do we really know who he is and what he can do? Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And I love this. And then he said, loose him and let him go. <laughs> I have preached this thing and danced all over the stage and said, loose him and let him go, that he, Lazarus had to be Pentecostal. because He came out bound hand and foot, jumping out of that grave, and they took them grave clothes off him, and he was shouting and hollering, but I think there was more to the story than just that. You see, when he said, loose him and let him go, I think he was trying to tell the disciples and the crowd of people that wanted him dead that where you are and where you have been, I can loose that 
that mentality and that thinking. I can loose those grave clothes, that dead thinking. I can pull that off of you, and I can give you new life, and I can give you a reset in your life. But listen, this is the hard part. People don't want to hear this. But before he could do that, he still died. I believe that the church is heading for the new beginning. I believe that there is a hard set, hard reset coming to the church. I believe it. But I believe our worst days are not behind us. I believe they're coming. I believe that we are heading for some very tough times. I believe it with all my heart. And that's why I preach the way I do. And that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. I'm telling you, we don't need pomp and circumstance. We need a revival not a series of services, but if it happens that way, I'll take it. We need an awakening inside of us. We need lives of supernatural. I just don't even know how to, how to say what I want to say. I'm hoping that you're catching this. Father God, I did everything that you told me to do. I said everything you told me to say. I won't go any further with it. I'll finish it up next week. But God, I ask you that you would touch your people. Would you stand with me for just a minute? Just give me just a minute and I'll, I'll, I'll close. God, I did everything that you told me to do and said what you told me to say. God, I am scared for what I see coming from the church makes me nervous. God, I believe that you are standing at the grave asking the church to roll away the stone. And I believe, God, that you are ready to loose people and let them go. God, I believe that we're just not quite where we need to be. And I believe, God, that pain is a great motivator for change, and that's what it's going to take. God, I ask you, number one, for grace and mercy. Number two, God, I ask you for an awakening to take place that we have not seen before. God, you've done it in times past. We've, we've read it. We've studied it. I've took tests on it. God, the great awakenings that have took place throughout the course of the world, throughout the course of America. And God, I am asking you for an awakening to take place in the church like we have not seen before. God, show us there is more to it. God, show us there is more to this than ball games and parties. God, show us, God, that there's so much more to life than what we have right now. God, create a hunger inside of us. David said, create a clean heart, renew a right spirit. God, we pray the same thing today, God, but we pray it a little bit different. God, create a hunger inside of us, God. Renew a right spirit in us, God. Make us hungrier than we have ever been before. God, to where it's nothing but you. All we want is you. All we need is you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I'm not going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm not going to ask you to do none of that. I'm going to give a quick altar call. If you need to respond then I want to pray with you, and I'm going to ask a few of the prayer team to pray with me. If not, we're going to go eat hamburgers and hot dogs, because I like that too. But I want to say this to you. There are some people in here today, you can't even make eye contact with me. You're so nervous. You're like a long-tailed cat in a room with a rocking chair. You're nervous. You're scared to death you're going to make eye contact with me, because you keep saying, every time he looks at me when he's preaching, he's got that weird look in his eye. to think of a good joke right here, but I won't. <laughs> Are you in here today and you need to be loosed? Are you in here today and you need to be loosed? Are you in here today and you say, you know what, Pastor, that's where I'm at. I know God. I know about Him. I know all about Him. But I need to be loosed. I need to be loosed. If you're in here, I'm going to give you just a couple minutes and then I'm going to close. If you're in here today and you need prayer, and you need somebody to stay here and pray with you, I promise you there'll be food left when we're done. But I really feel like God wants to lose some people this morning of some things. If you're in here, these altars are open. Come on. I'll give you just a minute. I know. Let's say it this way. I could come get you. I come get a few of you. You can't even look at me. I could come get you, but if I have to come get you, I'm going to have to continually come get you. And, and Jesus didn't go to Calvary in a stretch limousine and an Armani suit and die of lethal injection. No, he did not. He had to man up, and he was embarrassed, 
and he had to carry the cross. Come on, I'm saying to you today, we've got to just man up, woman up here. Come on. Come on. Are you in here? Would you let God touch you today and give you a reset? He hasn't forgot about you. The very fact that you have that feeling in your gut right now and it is beat your heart's about to beat out of your chest is proof. It should be proof to you that God hasn't forgot about you. Pastor, you're pulling unusually hard. I know it. I am. I feel it this morning. I'm going to pull for just another minute. The very fact that you're here today, because you, the very fact you feel what you feel should tell you that God's not through with you. Come on, are you here? Are you here? Come on. Come on. Can I get a couple ladies to pray right here? Come on, a couple of you ladies. There, there's, 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 come on, you're here. You're here. You're here. Come on. Give you just another minute. Just another minute. I'm going to stop. Father God, I thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And Father, I pray, Lord, that you would touch us as we go our separate ways today. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless the food we're about to receive. And God, I pray, Lord, that it would be strength and nourishment with all that grease in it to our bodies and all that bread. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah, amen. You're, you're dismissed. You can fellowship out there. You can fellowship in here, whatever. But we're going to pray up here with, uh, with our sister. I love y'all. God bless you. 